Hello again, this should be, because uh, having dealt with Steve-O's comment in the first video, I go back to the comment section to get through the rest of it, and CSA Ricardo, our friend Ricardo, has put a comment in the same block as um, Steve-O's. So it's all um, mashed in there together. So maybe there's a general confusion, but let's just say for Ricardo that he's one of life's dryers. So his plugging away is much more likely, I would generally think, to eventually get to a solid understanding of things than somebody who thinks that they already understand it. And I think that's what's important. Um, you, you can never knock somebody that just says, look, I'm just trying to learn, and then says, well, I haven't quite got that, could you explain it again, this sort of thing. And I'll just repeat again that I don't have all the answers, of course, because I'm in exactly the same position. I'm wading through this stuff and learning as I go along, and I do the videos kind of um, showing you where I am in my learning curve. And um, good on Ricardo, I say, for plugging away. I'll read um, his comment because it, it, I think it helps us. And it knocks on from the Stevo um, video presentation and does what I really should have done anyway, which I might have done anyway. Let's have a look. I believe lending to governments sovereign risk under the rules of Basel 1, 2 and even 3 required no reserves to be held under their risk-weighted rules. Uh, now that's an exclamation mark, not a question mark, but let's go on. Therefore, not every loan required reserves, and look at the situation today. The banks cannot afford to take any losses against their sovereign debt. Why? Because they were never required to keep adequate reserves. Now this is a great excuse for me to try, the best I can, limited, to explain the difference between a reserve requirement and a capital requirement. All of that first paragraph of Ricardo should have been referring to capital requirements, but it's been conflated, confused with reserve requirements. Now, I can't, I can't say exactly where the confusion is because it's in Ricardo's head and probably an awful lot of heads. I'll run to the end and let's see if there's anything there that can help me more. The comment came from a wiki research which I posted previously but they are blacked out today I, and, and on that SOPA thing I would have blacked out probably if I knew more about it but I really it passed me by to a greater extent I, I've only read two or three articles on it I didn't really know what was going on so anybody that thinks I should have blacked o OTP out in solidarity sorry but um, I didn't I know under Basel 1 all bonds of OECD countries had zero risk weights no reserves required. Now this is where Ricardo's good. No reserve required. No reserves required. Question mark. And that's the way to go. And under Basel II, although improved risk measurements were put in place, well, okay. If the country's bonds were in a local currency, which of course contributed to the current problem, yeah. Under Basel III, the risk. The, the zero risk weighting will only disappear if sovereign credit rating falls below double A minus. And there's a lot of confusion in there. I'm not saying it's wrong, there's a lot of rightness as well. But let's have a look at knowing under Basel 1, all bonds of OECD countries had zero risk weights, no reserves required, question mark. No reserves were required, no. As long as I understand it, no reserves were required, and of course they weren't res required because that wasn't that wasn't the drive of Basel. Okay, so I've now got to try and explain the difference between reserves and reserve requirements and capital requirements in the Stevo presentation, which hopefully you've seen before. 
it was all to do with the old days and bank runs and that 50 billion band that um, Canada have just disappeared, thrown away completely because they know it's, it's a nonsense. And I wouldn't be surprised if the United States will th soon throw away that 50 billion band for reserves. It's a nonsense. In the, the today's banking, it's got nothing to do with anything um, because the it's all digital and the central bank can soon throw some digits over to the bank uh, swapping assets over it's it's just not necessary anymore okay those are reserves think of them as old-fashioned things where you had to have chunky bits of gold in your bank just in case people came back with their receipts for the gold to take the gold and all that sort of thing it's archaic it's got nothing to do with it's it's useless it's useless okay there are certain controls that central banks can do i think even china could use them to i think china uses them um to control banks like central banks use um instruments to control the economy like buying and selling um treasuries etc central banks can control their external members which are the banks by having them have strong requ reserve requirements but it, it's nothing to do with bank runs it's purely to do with um like in china it to be the uh, government tells the central bank that it wants more lending or less lending and it can control the lending on the reserves it's complicated i don't understand it all but for the western world we can effectively forget absolutely everything about reserve requirements it's that 50 billion band in the united states nothing the uh, excess reserves are 1.8 trillion right that's the difference and that shows how yes if everything went back to normal the banks would go back to just how they were the decade before the crisis and having about 50 billion for all of them in the central bank as what was called reserves and you can imagine that's just chump change for the entire american banking system it's nothing to do with anything all right so now we've got to go on to capital requirements is what which what basel's all on about now there could be in the background of basel reserve requirements mentioned in some sort of sub chapter sub chapter i don't know i certainly am not going to read basel one two or three to find out but basel is basically about capital requirements now i'm going to have to wave my hands around here a bit and okay let's think of say commerce bank which yesterday i drew an article in that i was going to present saying that they might be all right now probably something to do with the eltros that they might not need a capital raise now imagine on your televisions or your radios or wherever you get your information from the news readers saying things like these banks will need to raise new capital yeah nothing to do with reserves at all they raise new capital okay what is capital i've dealt with it a couple of times but it's it's a hard one because using the word capital is so deceptive it's just it's not tricky they're not trying to describe and um, deceive anybody but it is just deceptive and tricky because it throws your mind off you think capital they mean cash they mean money they need mean reserves but it's not right why would they want commerce bank for example to raise more capital it isn't that they want um now i won't i'd confuse myself if i said they want more depositors because that would actually work to an extent so let me tell you about say unicredit now okay are you sitting comfortably unicredit to raise more capital had a share offering and it was a split okay so the ownership of unicredit is the width of the screen they are the owners of unicredit the biggest bank in italy it's really pulling in uh, no don't get sidetracked nick the owners of unicredit are like this they needed to raise new capital recommended by absolutely everyone the news readers if you like said that unicredit had to raise new capital which means they have to sell more shares in the company in unicredit so there are more there's more shareholder equity of unicredit 
right? Now I'll quickly go through what happened with Unicredit. They did a, um, a share offering. The existing, no, I can't do it too complicated. We'd be here for ages. They sold 7.5 billion euros worth of new shares in Unicredit. Yeah. So the equity holding was 7.5 billion bigger. That is the capital requirement, or let's say, I'll keep it, I'll show up so I know. That's the main part of what a capital requirement is. It's the equity holding, it's the ownership of the com com company, right? Now, unfortunately for Unicredit, what happened was they raised 7.5 billion euros because it was underwritten by a multitude of different investment banks. But the share price dropped by an average amount of 8 billion euro while doing it. So it was a complete and utter cock up. But they were forced into this effort of raising more equity, more ownership of the company, more money, put, more people bought those shares directly from Unicredit. And I think it was at something like a 60% discount. That money was there. The ownership, you've got your bank balance sheet down the middle, left and right. Some people do assets on the, um, always for me, the, the assets are on the left. And I've got to swap it round because I'm doing a camera. Assets on the la left, liabilities on the right. Assets, liabilities on this side. Down the bottom left of, bottom right, liabilities <coughs> is equity. And what they need to raise this equity for this capital for is so that the central bank knows the difference between a company a bank that is insolvent or illiquid that is a capital buffer and it's a capital buffer the share ownership of unicredit commerce bank or bnp or bank of america is a capital buffer because if it goes into bankruptcy, let's say, what first goes is the equity. Which is down bottom left, bottom, no, forget where it is on the balance sheet. The equity is eaten first, yeah? The share, share, all the shareholders are wiped out. Now it is that that people are raising um, money for. That is what a capital requirement is. That's what it is. It's a capital buffer. It's the ownership of the company. It's the people that are going to get eaten first if there's trouble on the balance sheet. They get eaten first, then it's the sub-debt, and then it's the main debt holders, the guaranteed debt holders, and all that sort of thing. But forget those. We come to that in Irish cases um, where things really get into trouble. But what Basel is on about, it wants lots of... Um, money in the company that people have put there to buy ownership of the company yeah and then if the company makes a profit one year for example it can do multitudes of things with it what it often does is pay the shareholders a dividend and that money then is going out of the company but what they're trying to insist that they do now if a bank makes a profit and they're trying to get help them to make a profit by giving them Eltro money. If they make a profit, then that should be withheld from the shareholders and held on the, um, <coughs> strangely, on the liability side of the assets. As in, it's held then as the company's cash. It could be given to the shareholders, but it's held as company cash. So it is capital. It is capital reserves but it's much different to the capital reserves or excess reserves that are held um, on the other side that c i'm not sure about this but i'll throw it in just to make a strong point that cannot be used in a bankruptcy what is used in a bankruptcy is obviously the cash that's lying around first then all the um, shareholder equity is wiped out then the sub debt and then the senior bond, bond, bond holders going up and it's very confusing. And the depositors are normally pari passu, in other words, the same legal rights as the um, uh, guaranteed bondholders. 
And that's what all this confusion is. It's between capital requirements and reserve requirements. And capital requirements are so completely different to reserve requirements. And that is what Basel's on about, and that's what people are often on about, and it's got nothing to do with reserve requirements, which are an archaic twiddle nonsense. Yeah? So when you hear all this stuff on the radio or television or read it, the more likely that you're going to hear it, that banks are required to raise more capital, RBS must raise more capital, Commerce Bank, Unicredit, Bank of America, Citigroup must raise more capital. Yeah? It's got nothing to do with reserve requirements at all. I'll leave it there because I say I say any more. I'll be repeating myself because it's that's about as much as I know. Let's put it that way. But um, without knowing that, you're just not knowing anything. That's 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 kind of your first two steps into across the pond of confusion of banking and central banking. And I think we've touched on some important points today. So. That should be quite enough. And anybody that wants to point out where I'm wrong, I'd be happy to listen. But except if you're Zarathustra, please don't say it in a... I've, I've, I think I'm saying it in a really that is that way because I think people need it. And I think it just is absolutely true. Okay. So let's be nice about things. That's the bottom line. And good on Ricardo for um, putting things with question marks after them. Because it's people that do things with question marks after them that eventually learn things. And between us, that's what we're meant to be doing here is learning things. So we do a occasional exclamation marks, but generally things so we learn together are question marks. Cheers. Bye.